Raymond, go ahead. You have the floor. Okay, thanks everyone. Let's see, let's. I will move this and there we go. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, Henry mentioned the pretty key elements of success. Obviously, I won't summarize it, but you know, getting that traceability and the configuration management. Uh, what you'll get with this one is something that's a little different, uh, but also I feel just as important. Uh, it's part of the takes from two different sources. One, there are some sections on the needs and requirements manual uh, down in section two that deal with collaboration and communication. And while I think we'd all agree, you know, communication is good and we should collaborate, you know, do, do we really sort of go beyond that to say, okay, what, what are we fighting in our, our corporate culture? What helps, what is, what, what can we improve in the pursuit of gathering, you know, the needs and to, to derive the requirements, uh, talking with the customer, uh, even setting up uh, some of the, the systems that uh, Henrique mentioned. Okay, well, that takes negotiation and, you know, and in my experience, you know, and you mentioned, hey, let's get a new tool up there. You, you know, there are five people and seven different ideas on what tool should be rolled out. So uh, definitely some soft skills you know, can, can help move the technical work for it. So if you leave nothing else, uh, leave it with that connection. Uh, yes, I... Uh, privilege to be one of the co-chairs and the, currently work at, at Sandia as do systems engineering for different projects, mostly national systems. Uh, a lot of my later work is helping people on the front end, you know, get the requirements down, get the use cases. Uh, if, feel free to reach out uh, via email. Also, I'm on LinkedIn, fair amount. You can message me there. I'm happy to do any kind of follow-on questions or um, and have that dialogue. You know, and I, I think I speak for Tammy and Lou. We, we're interested in uh, how we can help, you know, help some real world problems. Okay, so what's what's, what's the gap here? We, we, I think a lot of us know of, of exciting tools. Sometimes they're deployed to certain extents in an organization, but, it, but no tool can do it all. Meaning there, there's, we still need to have interpersonal communications. We need to complete design work, which sometimes that's solitary, but sometimes it's very much team-based, you know, and, you know, even when, when we, we set up processes and, and have a, you know, corporate system, uh, e even with a, a digital ecosystem where, you know, if we go back to an earlier paper, we have that federated model, federated data model, we still need to talk to each other and we still need to work together. Uh, so the, that that's what we're trying to solve today. So we're going to work basically three different areas. Uh, one, the first two come from the manual. You know, we'll talk a little more about how collaboration, what, what that is and how it can help. Some of this you'll recognize, but I, I think you'll take away some new insights. Then how that is a little different than communication. Uh, things can be collaborative, you know, and there could be that, that good rapport. Uh, I hope we've all worked on teams where, you know, that energy was really functional uh, but still if we're communicating the wrong data or if, if our cm isn't right or heaven forbid we have three or four different sets of ground truth you know the best intentions and the friendliest of atmospheres uh, will still uh, not be a success so we'll address that and then finally i will bring in uh, some team effort we did uh addressing some culture i this was work from the IS 2022. So last year's IS was part of NCOSI's Technical Leadership Institute. Uh, it was part of cohort six. And then there are about 12, 13 authors on a, a group project we did. And we'll get a brief summary of what that is here. Uh, if you're interested in that paper, let me know. Uh, obviously the, the other contents uh, from the manual, uh, it's, that, that, that's the source of this. And today is really kind of just a refresher summary of what that is and to package it together. Uh, the good news is that it, these are solvable problems. These are not new problems. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of configuration management and change control. Uh, the, but even so, you, you get 
you get this additional bonus, this additional help with good collaboration. You know, and not everyone has to be friends, but at least when there's that base respect, you know, you can speak up and say, "Ooh, you know what? This this one system L model, we we exit this loop prematurely, and it's going to mess us up." All right, well, people need to volunteer that at some point. Uh, that goes double again for being willing to volunteer bad news of the management. You know, a lot of that is cultural and, you know, it involves a collaborative environment. Uh, Tammy and Lou, I, I know you've, I was on the call, I know you've been in, in charge of, of large projects. Uh, I, I suspect you very much appreciate when someone shares bad news in time to do something about it. So that, that's, that's the benefit of some of these groups. Okay, so this is the sources of the three pillars of the talk. And then uh, we'll start with collaboration here. Uh, I hope we can agree uh, without collaboration, things grind to a snail's pace. Uh, the, now, one caveat here, and uh, this came up from a colleague in uh, the COSI cohort, is that sometimes there could be too much collaboration from wrong people. Uh, for instance, there are times when a designer, coder, software, hardware designer needs to not be brought into the weekly systems meeting, uh, perhaps. So, I mean, there, there are balances here, but basically, uh, collaboration, you know, is this teamwork uh, between customer and the developer. I, I work mostly in a developer organization. Uh, there, there are third parties we have to collaborate with. Uh, I, uh, San Diego's mission, myself, we work in highly regulated areas where there's a lot of government oversight or a lot of Department of Energy, for instance, uh, instructions. And we have to work with uh, that staff to make sure we're in compliance. Uh, government is very interested not only in our final product, but also in how we develop the product. So, uh, this harkens back to Lou's talk yesterday. Uh, I'm in an organization that could be a quality organization. And every once in a while, people leave us off as a stakeholder, and then we have to come in. We, we're bound by our rule set, and then there's, there's little, sometimes there's some hurt feelings there. So, uh, even within the developer org, so within Sandia, with my group, within the project team, a lot of different groups, you know, and not just, let's say, quality or line development, but there's the materials group, you know, or, or the modeling group. We have separate modeling groups fortune to work in a fairly large outfit. You know, if, if we communicate the wrong thing to the modelers, they're going to do what we told them to do, not what we meant. So, uh, good news is uh, I've been on some projects where, you know, the collaboration is there. We can just call them up and say, hey, you know, we made a mistake or, you know, this doesn't look right. And say, so, um, you know, everyone, you know, everyone, enough people are on mission, you know, we can work through those problems. Uh, one other key takeaway, though, uh, the what I've seen interfere with collaboration is that there's um, sometimes an internal, often unwritten incentive structure. Uh, we'll talk a little more of that downstream, but the if the incentive structure basically discourages certain collaboration, that would help uncover faults, uh, pass on key information. Uh, that that's a operational issue that needs to be addressed. And sometimes it's subtle, you know, I, my experience is that people basically, you know, mean well and also work as, you know, we're incentivized. Okay, so we, we got to keep both those in mind. Uh, you may recognize this from the manual, but a lot of our projects are complex. They involve all sorts of different entities. Uh, we have the uh, multidiscipline project team and more and more. I didn't realize this as much at first, but uh, I, team members do not have an engineering background. Uh, so some of them are even new to systems engineering, and but they're they're key in procurement, okay, and then there's or receiving inspection. You know, I mean, uh, every once in a while you get burnt by a commercial part, maybe you procured, and somehow it uh, didn't meet requirements because it wasn't tested at the dock or something. So be able to communicate to just very different entities in a corporation to get a product to work. Uh, that's that's where it's all going. 
I mean, I, I think gone are the simple projects where we can just crank it out the desk. Uh, another uh, another uh, really new segment of the team are people who they don't have a technical background, but they want to do systems engineering. And, you know, maybe they, maybe they're from strict project management or even uh, in administration, you know, that they're doing office admin work. But, you know, they're very sharp and they want to do, there's a need for test compliance. Okay, so com communicating there and just really making them feel part of the team, you know, instead of, you know, having this sort of informal tier structure where, you know, the, you have the chief engineer up top and then it just goes down from there. Uh, I'm not saying that's anywhere here, but, but those things can creep up, uh, particularly in organizations that have been around. Point is that a lot of people on the team, very different backgrounds, all equally important. Now, there is a uh, mention of Agile. So Agile obviously is popular mode. Uh, the this, this applies even more to Agile programs uh, to have that collaboration there. And, but even if you're doing more a, a traditional waterfall approach, uh, no judgment there, sometimes that's appropriate. Uh, the collaboration is important, of course, but there are ways to structure the project and the program in a way that will we'll fill, uh, let's see, we'll get that right balance of collaboration. Now, for instance, uh, again, we, we don't want necessarily ground floor coders, you know, at all these high level customer meetings, but but then again, we, they can't be left off and, you know, just forgot about. So uh, there, there are ways to structure a, a program. And it's, again, some of this is in manual where it's steered from the top. So you have a strong systems team I work on a systems team, so I'm a little biased for a strong systems approach. Uh, that 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 steer things, okay? So there's, uh, I think Ford had a a requirement ownership idea where you would own the requirement through its life cycle. So here you might have a a systems team that owns different pieces, different subsystems, different requirements of the program, and then they're the the thread that interacts and ties them together. So even with Agile, Agile, there's got to be a group that creates the stories, you know, that gives the requirements, however modest, for different sprints. And then, you know, integrating it back all together while other people are doing the next thread and the, and the next story. You know, you, you still need that too. So the, uh, I still recommend a tiered structure for this. Uh, and this is one candidate. Uh, again, from manual, you have a core team up top working, you know, system level engineering, and then also tying into your know, project management at the program level where where that's tied in. Uh, then you have you just spawn off different working groups, you know. So you have on the left, there's you know PM working groups working more uh, you know, the PM side, and then you have the engineering working groups on the right. You know, just breaking up. Maybe it's for the physical architecture, uh, could be functional architecture or even uh, component line, but some of that those are broken up, so they do their work, and then they report to this core team to do the top level integration. Uh, the then for subject matter experts perform the, the engineering work, the design. You know, once we have our set of needs, then we create the our design input requirements. You know, that they're passed on. To, for engineers, obviously, to do their creative work. And then finally, you know, with, again, going to the previous slide where we had that large team, uh, there, there's life cycle, life support uh, for uh, work on some government projects. Uh, one of the uh, key persons on the team, this is a component uh, a, little, a couple of years ago, was technically in a project controller billet, but she, had some of the most longevity on the team, knew the part, was able to line up different finance. And and then when we had to do a respin, you know, she, she was right there and it it's it was just it was very smooth. And she Toronto being one of the, the core fonts of knowledge uh, for the team. So uh, the uh, that that part I wound up being very successful and you know was well received. So um, so anyhow the Having a having the tier 
And uh, the takeaway I'd suggest here would be that, you know, let's not forget, you know, the core team that integrates all the work. It's, it's not just so that everyone go freestyle uh, on Agile. And, and just then people wonder, okay, well, what story am I working on or, or how do I know I'm done? And then I can move to the next story. So that's you know, many other structures and approaches. Uh, this is just one idea. Now the uh, the collaboration uh, we've established that that's important. I think I'm going to speculate here. I think people grasp that people need to get along. Uh, the one other takeaway from that section is the kind of the need to address interpersonal conflict pretty quickly. Uh, that could stop both collaboration and communication. Uh, it's one of my least favorite engineering tasks, but I've, I've since declared it as an engineering task to manage conflict when it comes up. Uh, it's, I was on one project, uh, we were creating uh, some guidance and it just somehow the, uh, the, the meshing just didn't happen. It was a small team and I, I foolishly hoped it would get better. And, um, but what I need in retrospect, what I would have done is just have an honest dialogue. Like, hey, you know, it, it seems like we have very different ideas on a document where it should there should be some unity, and just have that uh, have that conversation. Uh, it's, I hesitate to elevate the management, but occasionally that is also required. But it's um, th these these new models, you know, this collaborative model, uh, even the the federated data where everyone's putting their their work into a, a common repository. You know, it's we're penalized even more for interpersonal conflict and we'll call it a scarcity mindset maybe than we were in the past because it's so integrated, it's easier. It just becomes more fragile in my opinion. So. Uh, with that, uh, for communications, uh, the, that that's the second half of this. You know, we, we've got let's assume we have a single model. Uh, let's assume we have basic configuration management and control there. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's cliche, but it's garbage in, garbage out. But the flip side of that is, even if it's great content in, if it gets mangled on the way out, then it's, uh, again, it, you have rework and it's just going to be extra cost. Uh, again, this comes from section 2.10 in the manual. And uh, let's, let's go back to, you know, getting those needs and requirements down. Uh, you know what, I'll, let me just do a quick poll here. Uh, who on this call, and you just raise your digital hand, uh, it has been involved in sort of customer needs elicitation. So you're, at a table with the customer. Uh, obviously, if you're a uh, consultant, you, you do this all the time. Uh, others, who, who, again, just you raise your hand, you can go off video real quick. They've had to sit down, they, they've had to, okay, Craig, thanks. Okay, I see some others. Okay, so that, so, oh, thanks, uh, Chris, Mark. Hey, okay, we're chiming in. Yeah. Hey, Fiorella, uh, good to see you. The there, there it's you know the raw communication. You have drawings, you're sketching things out. Uh, we're learning their needs, so that obviously involves you know going to a place of listening. Uh, I myself, I I need to be a little careful because about halfway through the customer's explanation, my design will pop in my head, and I need to hold off on that. So I will think I know what they either want or what they really want, but they just haven't articulated yet. And then I'll go off and say, okay, well, I think such and such power supply will work. But usually it's not that bad. However, part of communication is just, uh, for me at least, being patient and just calling that out, asking the questions. Okay, well, what does success look like? Uh, how do you know once we install this system that it worked and you delayed it? Okay, well, I'll do this task and instead of two weeks, it can do it in two days. Hey, that's great. Okay, but that that's deep interpersonal communication. So. 
uh, that is only the first step because once once we collect those needs, we have that set of needs that we like. Now it's deriving they're deriving to the requirements. Uh, the requirements obviously if we if we get a design input requirement set, we need that to be robust enough to pass to the designers. Uh, I, ideally, we would take our requirement set and go back to the customer. And I was on a project. Uh, this this goes back a little further, and we we had a very supportive customer. You know, they, they liked their work uh, in this other area, and they had a basically it was a business process flow problem to solve. Uh, they wanted a web based solution. Okay, well we had some programmers, and and I, I was on more of the systems team working, basically addressing needs. And they they we had to socialize them for the number of meetings we asked asked for them because they were used to okay have a meeting cut a statement of work you go off and do it okay well we did that to get some needs but then we had to circle back and say hey look here are our requirements and then here's a candidate physical architecture okay, if we built a system that looked like this would that meet your eventual need and they uh, we I said yeah yeah sure uh, yeah this this would work and Sure enough, we'd find out some wrinkle. Uh, one was, you know, one was they did not want different roles. So when we set up a web system, you know, they like, well, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll make you the admin, and then we'll have user roles, and they'll do the operations, you know, for roughly involved uh, key management. We'll, we'll do the processing for the approvals, and, and they're like, no, 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 we don't, they did not want an admin role. They just want five, five uh, logins or however many logins, the one role where the, everything looked the same. Okay, well, that's not something we would have come up with on our own, but they, they didn't want it. Uh, we were able to save some development costs and we just skipped that process. We even said, this would be easy to implement. Nope, we don't want it. And they wanted, they wanted simplicity. Uh, so they, uh, so that's the kind that's the, the gem that you can uncover if just hanging in there with the dialogue and you know at least for, for us we, we had to sort of relax our preconceived notions of what a good solution is and it turns out they we delivered on time they were delighted it worked just how they wanted it to uh, yeah we had to get our hammers out to get it installed right but uh, we worked through that and and, and it worked so they, you know, so so that involved a lot of different meetings that the customer wasn't expecting, and you know the customer has their day job, you know there there was an operational uh, command, so they they're busy, everyone's busy. Uh, but but it paid off. We, we were able to hang in there, insist on certain meetings, and it worked. So. Uh, the Now, going back to uh, communication, uh, obviously the we we do need to put out the right info. Uh, this is where a common model or a digital ecosystem can be very helpful, uh, particularly a, a single federated source of knowledge. Uh, but also, uh, particularly when we're sitting with that customer, you know, there's we we had to communicate well, and you know, the other half of this is we had to listen well too. So. Now, this is uh, a, a drawing, uh, again, you may recognize. I like to call it the Johnny Dangerously drawing uh, because we have the sender on the left, what they wanted to communicate. And then there are all sorts of filters and uh, and uh, on some level, the, depending on how dispersed the team is, uh, who knows what actually was received. Uh, you, you, there's an old U.S. movie, Johnny Dangerously, where a message is passed down to the lunch table. Okay, you, you know, when it goes through eight people, then the eventual message is completely different from the first one. It was some some rumor, and, and then uh, that that drift was was just well portrayed. But that drift can be very real, even among well-intentioned and capable engineers. Now, what that means is that. We, we can use these three keys, but we're going to at least be mindful of these as we're, we're communicating either interpersonally 
or if, especially if we're limited to some digital means, uh, putting things in the model, and then we're, we're assuming people get the right understanding from what they saw in the model. The model can be rock solid, but if people gain different interpretations, that's an issue. So. Now, here's the, the three. It's uh, what the receiver understood is what was communicated. It's, it's not what I meant to say. It's, sometimes it's not even what I actually said. It, it's, how it's how it's received. Now, the, to fix that, uh, a trick I like to use, it's not a trick, but uh, just a quick question. It's like, hey, okay, we talked about this. And we we want to architect it this way. Why don't you just quick uh, tell me what you thought you heard? How do you feel about it? And then just get them, again, 30 seconds. Hey, you just ask a question to verify that they got the right interpretation. Uh, this goes for design, uh, also a, a production approach, what materials to use and not use, uh, even uh, who to engage with, let's say at a, a different different agency or, or different uh, different group. Uh, the, the, this also goes for what not to share. Uh, I, I do believe you can overshare information. And if you stir up a whole department because they misinterpreted an innocent remark, that that's also time and money. I um, had one situation where we were pushing a, a requirements architecture. You know, we want to add a little more rigor, and I really thought it was the right uh, right approach. And our, our team was trying to just trying to negotiate and, and push it through. Uh, we probably tried to push a little too hard, so I wound up being this email uh, flame exchange, uh, flame war as well. Uh, which didn't help. Okay, the CC list grew, and then people got the wrong impression. And I was I was rightfully called into my managers and said, "Ray, please do not CC the world and or add to the uh, add fuel to certain E fires. Let other people handle it." Uh, lesson learned. Unfortunately, I've cleaned up my act here. However, the email we send is communication, and, and people people have feelings. Uh, people react. Uh, that that's real. Now, uh, the other time you may want to ask a question to verify that our message was received is what I call the polite head nod. So the, in the manual, this is described as things can appear to have been communicated correctly, but appearance can, appearances can deceive. Sometimes, you know, you might, might have experienced, you know, you're maybe telling a direct report, okay, you need to finish this task and do this PowerPoint and it has to be done this way and add this other report. And then you go, okay, yeah, whatever, all right, whatever. Just, again, uh, no need to be rude about it, but just say, okay, why don't you just repeat back uh, what you're gonna put in this report and we're putting this PowerPoint just so I know we're on the same page. That way you can either get uh, the, the right answer back or it's like, ooh, uh, I, I kind of lost you midstream there. Can you go back over it? Much less expensive to find that out now instead of wait two weeks, this presentation is due uh, to, to your manager, our manager. And, and then, you know, it's, it's completely wrong and there's an all nighter there, so. Now, the third part is that there are many modalities and forms, uh, different types of media, different ways to communicate, whether it's digital, uh, you can even call Zoom digital. Uh, what, uh, is another aspect which may help, uh, particularly if if somehow you, you're not getting through. Uh, there, there's a person and you, you're just not on the same page. There's not in sync. There are some communication techniques. Uh, it's called neurolinguistic programming. I believe it's been around, I think, since the, since the 70s, depending on how you count. Uh, NLP for short. And there we cover aspects like mirroring and matching. So if I'm uh, talking to my manager, I, I actively try to do this. You know, I will try to mirror uh, that cost. So, a uh, just a brief example. You know, if, uh, if they if they're sitting back and maybe their hand goes to their their chin, I'll try not to be too obvious, but I, I might also slowly you know, move back and you know may scratch my face or something. Uh, this obviously is not an NLP course. But there's there's content out there, and it's it's shown to be be pretty effective. 
Now, the, the goal there is to just build rapport. The, the goal is not to manipulate. It's simply to just create a communication channel that reflects how we're wired as humans, uh, simply to aid the, the accurate transfer of information and ought to communicate even uh, tough content, uh, uh, discussions about performance. You know, I, my experience is that if I just engage a little bit of NLP, uh, the my my leader feels more comfortable, and then also they feel that I've understood what they're trying to say, and I very much want to understand. I you know, obviously I want feedback, but if I, if I'm out of sync there and there's no rapport, sometimes my manager, in my hallucination, sometimes I think, well, did, did Wolfgang really get the the point there? I, I want him here. Uh, that's not what any of us want in our people we report to. I want, them to, I want to communicate that I have received what they're trying to say. Anyhow, I, I invite you to investigate that. There's a lot of literature out there. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for references, I'm uh, happy to chat offline. So. Now, the, we've talked about collaboration, uh, also communication, and, and how you know it's having just a general collaborative environment, particularly at these higher levels of the project structure, you know, the systems team, systems organization, between systems and you know, program management, how that support. And for communicating, you know, how it's communication, you know, needs to be thorough and occasionally checked to verify, okay, how was our message received? And we, we talked about different different ways, different situations where, where that could be you know, important. Uh, but how can we make this stick? So how can we bake this into our organization? Uh, have changes be long term if we're, if we're trying to in increase collaboration and communication, and then kind of fold this into the culture. We're systems engineers, so if we can also blend in a little systems thinking as, as a as part of this, and even collaboration. You know, when when we think, hey, we should check with procurement to make sure our um, are receiving uh, is is doing what they they need to do with some tests. That that's a system thinking. That's understanding, you know. Oh, we buy these commercial parts. You know, we need to know what's happening on our dock. Make sure they're not, you know, these sensitive electronics aren't sitting out in the rain by accident. So, just an example. So the system thinking is blended into this, but if we can add it a, a, a little formally. Then now we we really have some power here. Um, Good news is that cultural change, while hard, uh, is certainly doable. And where this ends is there's a concept called a collaborative systems thinking culture. Uh, that is, is the holy grail of all of this. Now, this part is, was worked on through uh, the leadership cohort. And again, there's a paper in IS 2022 that shares a little more detail. Also in that paper, we go in depth into a seven phase change process where you can start to introduce, you know, some of these cultural aspects into your organization. Uh, we'll pass on the, the change model here. We'll briefly introduce it. But again, let me know if, if you're interested. All right, well, we, if we all work in different cultures. I actually have a fairly low number of employers. I worked for one organization for about five years and I've just been with uh, Sandia for 15. Uh, but still, very different cultures between the two, even though they're still in the military defense sector. Uh, but also within Sandia, you know, I've been, been lucky to work on a lot of different programs and how they do business is a little different. And where I've succeeded, I've adapted to the culture and tried to work, work within. And where I had trouble, even uh, within the same group, uh, the manager changed. Uh, they changed the manager, and then the what would be really the chief engineer of the program. Just within a two months, you know, both moved on and they replaced with new ones. And I made the cultural gaffe of doing my work, assuming that the the new leadership had the same cultural mindset as the old one. And I just got crossways left and right. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. Uh, which is how I learned to appreciate 
you know, culture and just being attuned to these types of things. So uh, uh, there are a few other things I was able to clean up too, so, which is fine. Uh, however, uh, if we're doing systems engineering, we're building products, and particularly if we're trying to capture needs and requirements in, let's say, a culture that is more, you know, going in and cutting metal and writing code, they, they don't really have that deep requirements instinct. Uh, this is where this is where we need to see, we'll have more benefit if we can appreciate the culture and have that as part of our our strategy. Now, uh, we know things are much more complex. Uh, the uh, We propose that focusing on this collaborative systems thinking culture, or at least parts of it, you know, can, can really help us solve more and more complex problems. And then we we have a seven step process, similar to Cotter's eight step model, where, you know, how, how do we actually do this? How, how can we make change in an organization? Uh, it felt foolish just to ignore that part of it. Uh, as many of us know, cultural change can be tough. Okay, we're going back to uh, 2008. We have Lamb and Rhodes had a good definition. Uh, it's just it's emergent behavior, uh, resulting from interactions of different team members uh, with a variety of approaches, thinking styles, processes. Sometimes the tool set's very different. Uh, commun the communication modalities can be very different too. And all toward the end goal of making a product, creating a system. Now, how do we bring about this culture? Okay, well, systems thinking has to be defined, uh, socialized throughout the, the organization. And then um, to change anything, we have to understand where we're at. Okay, what is our existing culture? Uh, we have to understand both. Now, the, the good news is that a lot of times, what I've seen is that there are aspects of system thinking in an organization already, uh, either just how they structured uh, uh, a product team uh, with the membership, or just even co-locating very different roles in the same hallway. You know, they there are elements there. So rarely do we go in; it's a total loss. Uh, rarely do they call it systems thinking, though. They they call it uh, maybe cooperation, or oh well, well, hey Teresa down the hall, she takes care of that and. And, you know, oh, so-and-so runs uh, change control. Uh, if you get larger and larger projects, sometimes that informal method breaks down. But but I actually work on a project now where, you know, there is a, thankfully, we have a culture where, hey, you just, you can ask the chief, en chief engineer a question. Said, hey, uh, we're having problems with this. Uh, do you have two minutes or something? And, oh, yeah, fine. Or something. So it uh, th that helps. All right, so they, th th there's a, a lot of benefit. Uh, whenever we, we try and do cultural change, uh, we, again, my experience, we have to lead with how it's going to help everyone do their job better. So benefits include, obviously, in the engineering side, you know, we, there's less risk of being burnt by missing an interface. So we, we have our interfaces there, we, we spend effort. And with this systems thinking mindset, you know, we're, we're trying to, think okay who else does our system touch or who else does needs to be involved uh that 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 can uncover hidden requirements uh for for testing which can wind up being very expensive you know if if with with enough systems thinking we can have we can set up a test might be a little more expensive than we first thought but it's going to cover what we need to cover and then again we lower technical risk uh we, we lower technical debt of you know missing a requirement and then hoping it works out so and then other aspects you know design uh could benefit because they have the right input uh, i had one friend uh, this was years ago he claimed that he designed the same power supply four times because he, he just didn't quite have the right drawing <laughs> uh it's uh they left about it now but back then you know you're burning time and money but and then, of course, uh, there are PM aspects. Uh, then, and when you get to the subsystem, uh, the you have some isolation of the designers, but the the benefit here is they're queued up with the highest chance of success. Success uh, with, with again design input requirements are mature. 
you know, once we pass those off, then they, they can do their work. All right. The, let's see, I feel I'd be remiss without discussing some plan on how would we, we try and uh, deploy this in our organization. For instance, we let's say we have a small group, uh, we things are working pretty well, but they can improve and, and somehow maybe things are strained with this other sister department that we need to interact with. Uh, not that they're unpleasant, but just somehow it's not clicking. So for, for impl implementing though, uh, the recommendation, again, start with something small. Uh, some of you will recognize this, but if we can get first an awareness and characterize what is the issue. Okay, well, we, we have trouble getting an interface document from uh, this outside entity. Uh, the, this happened on a, a past project. Uh, somehow the um, programmatics weren't in place for the data exchange. Uh, and, and, and somehow it, it took a little while to fix, but, but awareness of what is the issue. Hard to solve a problem if we, we can't characterize it. Uh, again, uh, identifying the current state. And then uh, just try something small, some small project, you know, have some, an early win. Uh, that's something that we could take to our management to, to show promise and say, hey, you know, we, we succeeded in this small pocket over here. I think we could scale it. And oh, by the way, if we do, it'll solve this uh, current state problem that we previously identified. This goes back to communicating. When we, whenever we want to make change, we at least want to tell our leadership and management what we're doing and why we're doing it. Then once uh, we have a little more support, we can document, you know, how how do we want to roll out something bigger? Okay, maybe take a bigger uh, test project or maybe start to address, you know, the core issue of, hey, you know, the, there's a, a stilted communication link between these two bodies. What What is the block? A lot of times it's not going to be touched. Then what, once we scale a little bit, we're going to see more barriers. So again, we can work those as they come up. Uh, new gaps gaps and holes will, will show up even as we're gaining momentum. And then uh, again, we work those as they arise. And then finally, with some traction, we've showed some results. We, we've either solved the programmatic problem, then we can train to say, okay, if you have this issue, here's what you need to do. And you know, we can work to make sure that that issue isn't not only is it other places in the in the project, but you know maybe in cuts of policy to to say, all right, well, before we move forward, we'll have an MOU with this other organization and just get that done out of the way first, so we're not you know losing two three months waiting for a drawing. Okay, again, more info is on the more info on this is on the the IS paper. Now, how do we know we're making progress here? Well, there, there are things we can look for. If we go on the right side, uh, certain f flags. Okay, if, if the culture uh, rewards uh, repeated heroic activity, uh, some would call us a hero culture. Uh, certainly, if someone comes in and really adds value to a project, you know, gets it back on schedule or leads to victory, that they should be acknowledged uh, and awarded. But if the culture is such that that doesn't fold back into, okay, how, how do we do this differently? How, how can we avoid this fire in the future? That it could be a hero culture. And then that's a flag that, you know, we should introduce some of these uh, collaborative uh, systems thinking methods and, and find a way to bake them into how we do business. Uh, you may have experienced uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I did as well, the, there was a large initiative Okay, and it involved, you know, deploying uh, some uh, quality techniques, uh, and you know, I, I was really excited about them. And we had like a two-year arc where we really, you know, went full bore and we deployed uh, these these techniques. Uh, it, was, it was a lean technique, and got the value, had the benefit, and, and then somehow it was radio silent. You know, that there wasn't continuing training, uh, and obviously we're working on that, and that that's a you know, process improvement. But I, I would caution avoiding the, you know, the, the rush of victory and then just letting it just flop. 
Uh, so that, and anyhow, that, that's where the cultural aspect comes in. Uh, if teams seem fragmented, and fragmented does not mean geographically spaced, but it's just, hey, we haven't heard from, from Jill in like three months, so what's she working on? Okay, well, sometimes just a five-minute phone call can, can fix that, and maybe she's working hard on the wrong thing. All right, that, that costs time and money. If uh, Now, there's always time pressure, but if it's somehow inordinate, uh, unusual, to where you know a, there's a, just a mismatch there for everyone is simply so focused at the desk, you know, that there is, there's no more time for team meetings or something. Uh, one, one friend of mine had, had a, was really on task. He said he was not going to attend a meeting for like four weeks until he, unless it was his direct manager, so he could get this one task done. Uh, honestly, at the time, it made sense and, you know, he got it done, but uh, uh, that, there was a, that's a flag if that starts happening. And then, of course, is, well, we've always, does, always done it this way. Uh, I think we've seen that. Now, moving to the left, on the flip side, uh, the things that help. Again, we mentioned communication. Okay, that can help, you know, expose some of these barriers to, to getting uh, more systems thinking into the culture. Uh, for instance, there, there might be uh, resistance from a product team. Uh, this was um, a rel relative of mine told me this. He was the, the navigation group had a, a working nav unit, a working... Um, I believe it was a gyroscope, and they were asked to do all the systems engineering, but they were just confused because the product worked, they knew the specs, it, it was a drop-in for, for certain product lines, and there's just a lot of resistance there where, well, either, the, the, well, the conversation would have had to have been had. Have the conversation. So maybe system engineering isn't appropriate, or maybe it needs to be described, hey, this is why we're doing it, because we're moving to model-based and and so the, there could be legitimate barriers and objections by senior engineers that if there's effective communication, we can expose those and then we can work. If you're just trying to ram it down someone's throat, I, I think we all know how, how that would work. Uh, the other one here is, are there contrary opinions in the space or is everyone just consistently agree? Uh, if there's consistent agreement and there isn't some protest or some differing opinions, uh, that can be a flag too. Now, once the decision is made, we, we move on, of course, but you know, look, looking for that uh, can expose a potential hole. And then there's just being aware of, of other, other uh, for us, it's other institutions. Uh, we work with a production agency. Uh, we need to be aware of their needs and constraints and, and then just basically employ everything we've talked about so far collaboration, communication, understanding, uh, similarly to make a working product. Final caveat, the incentive structure, what drives what we do and why we do it, that's not to be ignored. Uh, pe people, well-meaning people, including myself, uh, I've, gone, uh, I've gone through how I've, I've been incentivized a lot of times rather than other things. So they are not always formal. Now, you may be thinking, okay, all this sounds great. You know, I'm all for it. I'm all for motherhood. I'm all for, you know, in the U.S. at least, apple pie. Uh, does any of this work? What are people's experiences uh, from the field? So, so we hosted a workshop. Uh, it was within the Technical Leadership Institute group uh, last November. And it just shared, so what are your experiences on trying to implement some of this collaborative systems thinking culture? whether it's increased collaboration, rolling out systems thinking, maybe some training, what are your experiences? And we use one of these sh uh, shared workspaces, uh, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, we use Miro. I think Microsoft has a copy. And we, we found some interesting things, uh, some of which resonated and some of which uh, were, were novel. Okay. One of the big takeaways is a culture can be complex. Uh, it's especially these days with things dispersed, very hard to just say, you know, thou shalt and, and tell people to do things. You know, we, we have, and honestly, particularly with senior people, you know, we, we owe them the respect of, hey, let, let's, let's discuss what we're trying to do, get their buy-in. 
Uh, systems thinking, uh, it's hard to just tell people to be a systems thinker. What does that mean? You know, they, you know, there's training out there that can be very helpful. But then again, training takes money and money takes communication with, with leadership who has the unenviable job of having to manage resources and also execute a program. So, uh, but the consensus was there are avoidable problems we can prevent. Uh, do, doing some of these techniques, yes, the, they've been good. Many people had stories about, you know, being burnt and these problems were avoidable. Uh, but the, also to make a cultural change, that's got to come from the top. You know, there needs to be training, uh, some consistent tracking. Uh, management needs to be on board uh, to, to really, not necessarily to do the, uh, the preliminary startup projects, but to really roll it out. Uh, going back to this other project I was on, the they they did roll it out. Uh, pre most people were trained. It came down from the director level and above. We are going to do this lean technique on this part of the program and track the results. And, and honestly, we got a lot of value out of it. So, uh, but, but everyone was on board. Uh, recalcitrants and rebels were were dealt with, you know, at, at that point. Okay, uh, wrapping up here, uh, it's doing all these things, any improvement in this area, boosting collaboration, going all the way to, well, uh, identifying where the communication goals are, uh, technical or non-technical, uh, getting things into the culture, you know, driving systems thinking, not with everybody, but at least with like a systems team. Uh, it's hard work, you know, no, no one said it was easy, but they, they also shared some successes, you know, that it's very doable. Uh, good news, uh, relationships, you know, that one-on-one, -on -one, they still count. Uh, longevity in a certain position, you know, that experience and expertise uh, still carries much value. Uh, and, and contributors to these areas do not need to have a technical background. You know, project controllers, uh, acquisition, uh, procurement, you know, a lot of them have systems thinking. They just don't call it that. And obviously very valuable contributors to the team and essential uh, to get this out. So uh, if that's another lesson. I One of the things I learned was just to expand my scope of who can really help. Also, uh, incentive, culture drives incentives. So just at least know what they are. We don't have to change them all at once, but we, we can't ignore them either. Because it, when the training ends, a lot of times we, we go back to just how we're driven. Uh, even of events uh, not during work hours. You know, the there are things, even just going out for dinner for a project team once in a while, team building activities, uh, they can really help. You know, they can break down some barriers, uh, particularly with uh, the collaboration. You know, if, if we could feel a little more comfortable with each other. Uh, one thing uh, we did try here is, uh, was, I'm on a project now, we created a new meeting series. Uh, it's only once a week, uh, limited attendance, but we invite different engineers to this, what's basically a systems meeting, where we just knock out the technical issues of the day and just have a dialogue. And that's really helped over the last probably nine months, getting information out, uh, making people feel included, getting issues that need to elevate to the system level. Well, obviously we haven't solved them all, but you know, at least we know what we're, we're working with. So that's been very value added. Uh, it's, there are collaboration tools also that are pretty advanced and offer promise as well. Okay, for all of this, uh, the big upside, there, there are reasons to, to pursue collaboration, communication, systems thinking, and to drive some of that into the culture. Uh, there's obviously customer satisfaction, better pr program and product performance. Uh, we have a mindset and a culture where we can take on new work and then execute that new work as well. So. Now, going back to needs and requirements, uh, what we do is important. And it's not just needs and requirements, of course, we, it's the whole life cycle. Uh, ask these questions, you know, in, in your group. Uh, do you feel there's sufficient collaboration? Uh, could there be communications problems in particular, are there communication problems that we don't know about? Those are the ones that can really bite us. Uh, is there a systems thinking uh, that's already there that we can identify? Say, hey, you know, that's great systems thinking. That's a great approach. 
we absolutely need to think of that uh, other aspect. Uh, again, not necessarily limited to your engineering staff. And then as, as you gain some traction here, if, when you consider to, to implement some of this, ask, okay, how do I keep this going? How do I bake this into just how we do business? Not necessarily writing policy, but you know, do we have ongoing training? Do we, do we create working groups, informal, you know, that just keep, keep some of this dialogue and keep the relationships going? A lot of potential. Uh, it is hard work, but with looking at these, particularly when we're doing our technical work, uh, we're going to find that our projects finish on time. Uh, it's, it's far more pleasant to be on these types of projects and programs. Retention goes up. Our ability to win and execute new work actually will increase. And our, our contribution, uh, not only to our companies, but to, to our customers, is, uh, will only increase. Questions, thoughts, uh, what's your experience? Hey, Raymond, this is Lou. Um, it seems like dealing with people is considered messy by a lot of system engineers, and they like to avoid messy. I worked for a large um, government organization that had training. Um, they had a two-week course. They divided up into two different sessions and the first week was on hard program management and engineering skills and the second week was on the soft people skills that, like you're talking about <clears throat> and it was interesting that most of the people would sign up for the first week <clears throat> but for some reason they didn't have time to sign up for the second week <clears throat> Ouch. But I really well, appreciate it. Oh. oh go ahead well, I really appreciate you bringing this up because, you know, I really feel the soft skills are extremely important in the communication skills, the collaborative nature. And, you know, it's one reason we put those in the manual because of how important that is. And system engineers to be, need to be more balanced, um, both the hard and soft skills. Well, you, you brought up an even better point, Lou, the, uh, for the training. Uh, first, agree with, with the soft skills. But the uh, one struggle I've had with training is getting getting a week, getting people off off the line and a week in a classroom. That one, that's tough. I I think to, to pull off two weeks, uh, they would almost have to be forced to go, which uh, which has its own penalty. Um, but at, at least at least the, their leadership was savvy enough to realize, hey, this is a gap, but then this is another gap. Uh, it's, the, the times when I've really stepped into a, a career pothole have have been in the soft skills arena. That's for sure. Uh, rarely, definitely. So, thank you, Luke. Thank you for bringing us this presentation, Raymond. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.